Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast with myself, as ever, Alex Connor. And we're back outside of EMF here in the Gold Coast. And I'm with a special guest, a former Lion, a current member of the Fearless community, Ryan Wern. How are you, sir? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, yeah. pretty good this morning. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you joining me, my friend. Going to share some of your story. So this one going to be... I guess a little bit different, but in some respects that we're still sort of getting out some real and raw knowledge, but I think this one's gonna be quite good because I know it's gonna be very, as we always say, raw, but it's also gonna help a lot of people out there who might be going through some similar battles. So I guess to give us a bit of a synopsis and paint a picture, tell us who you are, what you do, and why. I might just get that mic. Sorry, I'm just gonna turn this around quickly. Sorry, guys, just because of the light's gonna keep falling off on you. There you go, uh, there you go, sweet. Technical difficulties. There um, we go, we're in. <laughs> it's a bit like that. All right, so my name's Ryan Wern. Um, I'm by day a bartender, by night a gamer. So just have a like, bit of fun. Love, uh, do go to the gym. Thanks to this guy. He helped me get back into it. And he's helped me along the way with his, his knowledge. So, but a um, little bit about me and my story. Um, I have, well, I'm still going through a battle of cancer. Um, not your typical lung, prostate, um, heart, head, none of those. It's completely different. It's called synovial sarcoma, and that's just a deep muscle and tissue. So I injured myself playing sport a long time ago, had constant, constant pains, never really got to the bottom of it and it just in the end ended up blowing up to the point where i had it was about that big and, and for people what for people listening about what two fists would you say yeah it was um i'll say the diameters from what i can remember i think it was 11 centimeters wide 10 centimeters long hmm. and nine centimeters deep so like a lawn bowl yeah it's, it's approximately yeah yeah um so it was pretty big. Um, I've been going through extensive treatment for the past pretty much year. Uh, started in April last year and finished in March this year. And it practically knocked me on my backside and uh, nearly killed me. Nearly, nearly ended me. Mm. So very, very raw. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And watching that as well, you know, sort of via social media and listening on it was so it was so rapid. Yeah. Or it seemed so rapid, you know, from the outside in and just watching that escalation and then even, you know, as someone who's younger, that is something that it's generally well, and you can correct me here because obviously you've been for it you probably ask all the right questions or, you know, you've you've sort of knocked out that door. For young people, generally cancer is not massive. And if it is, it's usually a causation of either sun cancer, usually, from, mm. you know, the, the exposure to the hot weather, especially here in Australia, or it might be something that's genetic, you know, like it's a mutation, something yeah. like that, or it could even be lung cancer, but usually that's a, that's a later onset. So talk us through kind of that initial stage and identifying it uh, in terms of what the type of cancer was, the signs, the symptoms, and then going through that initial like diagnostic period as a as a young person and going, hang on, well, shit, I didn't think it would have been this. Uh, well, me personally, I don't know about anyone else, but I always, if something's not right, I always search for the worst mm. possible outcome. Because then if that gets diagnosed to be the worst outcome, I can hit the ground running with like what I need to do. Yeah. Expect the best, yeah. prepare for the worst. So. Basically, I was already thinking because I had constant pain in my groin area, in my leg, in my thigh. So, um, yeah, I was just kept on going back to the doctors because I knew something wasn't right in my leg. And then um, they kept on telling me it's just muscle memory from a previous injury. And then one day I slipped at work and I ended up on crutches. And usually I'd be off work for a maybe a week tops with this pain. A month later, I was still on crutches, struggling to walk on my right-hand side. So I decided to give a self-examination of my leg. 
Hmm. You said there was a protrusion there, wasn't there? Yeah, um, you could physically see the tumor protruding from my leg. And it also felt like touching a Wood. steel beam or solid hardwood. Very, very hard. Very hard, yeah. yeah. Painful to touch? No, surprisingly. Interesting. It wasn't that painful to touch. So I could push in as hard as I can and the tumor didn't hurt. It was where, where it was, it was also slightly pushing against my sciatic nerve. Okay, hence so the pain. The pain, the back, lower back pain, the pain through my leg because my hamstring was constantly being um, tight, trying to compensate. Mm. Very, very difficult. So back to the doctors and I basically said, give me every single scan that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, because there's something in my leg that's not meant to be there. You need to get to the root yeah. cause, yeah. And plus I'd lost two jobs because of this. Yeah. Having too much time off work and not knowing what was wrong, so they, jobs just thought I didn't want to work. Yeah, they thought you were just yeah. playing up. So, Especially being a younger individual, yeah. they, they jumped to conclusions. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I first had, it was an ultrasound and a CT scan. Mm -hmm. The CT scan, I'm pretty sure, didn't show much, but the ultrasound showed this kind of growth. But initially, we thought it was just a massive blood clot, a hematoma. So they're like, all right, let's get, get an MRI to just make sure it's nothing too bad. So, yep, so we went and got the MRI, and they said, this does not look good. It looks like a tumor. Uh, so we'll send you down, because I was living down in New South Wales at the time. And the closest hospital was Albury, Madonga, which was two hours away. And then they sent me down to Peter McCallum, which is the major cancer research facility in the whole of Australia. So specialists. Yeah, specialists just for cancer, nothing else, just cancer. So I went down to Peter Mac, they did a biopsy, which is not a fun procedure really. No, it's not. I, I was knocked out for it, but still. The pain when you wake up and you don't take your you accidentally forget to take your pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You let the pain, you gotta chase the pain, but it gets ahead and you're like, oh yeah, yep. felt that. Um, basically they get this nice long needle so if you don't like needles but it's about that long for people watching a good what 12 centimeters yeah 15 centimeters yep and they just went right in took a little bit of um the tissue out the tumor sent it off to the lab to get it tested and unfortunately synovial sarcoma mm. which and it was i got lucky because this tumor was malignant and for those watching, malignant means it can freely move around the body. So I appreciate you explaining the definitions too. That's yeah, good. No, that's Thank right. you. Because you can get two types of tumors, benign and malignant. Benign means it's in one place and it's stationary. One place, it's not active, and that it will ne won't go anywhere else. Malignant means it's active. It can move. It can move around your bo body, and if a little bit breaks off into your bloodstream, lymphatic it's very, very bad because... Because it can just travel everywhere, yeah. yeah. So I got lucky that it didn't decide to do that. So it just stayed in that one place in my groin slash pelvic area. But just to jump in, body is quite amazing in that respect mm. where usually when you have these growths, inflammations in the body, whether it's a all the way to a simple pimple, you know, it's people go, you know, why is it yellow and why is it? Well, it's collecting that oil, it's collecting that sort of waste product and it's trying to retain it from the rest of the body. It's when you go in and squeeze it, it spreads, you know, you can get more pimples. You know, it's oversimplifying it, but same sort of thing when you have a tumor. Yeah. The body's trying to contain all of that poison, if you will, in one area and it doesn't want to spread, it's it's quite amazing. Because people think, oh, it's disgusting, but the body's trying to help you yeah. rather than just, man, you know, a lot of the time if those if those tumors go, that's when it's um, very toxic to the rest of the mm -hmm. body. But but continue on, Brian. Uh, so they called me back into Peter Mac. It was about 
maybe three weeks after I had the biopsy. So three weeks of what actually is it? Is it actually cancer? Like my mind's just non-stop freight train, just constantly going, going, and going, and going. Um, but yeah, then they called me back down, and everyone was telling me, "Don't worry, it's nothing. It's nothing. You'll yeah, be she'll fine. be right." Yeah. And I was the only one that was like, no, it's just something really bad. Like, they have mentioned this C word. Sometimes you just get a gut feeling. Mm. And I just had that feeling that I've been struggling with pain in this area for too long. There's now this massive anomaly, mm. we'll say, in my groin area. That's not meant to be there. So mm. in my head, I was like, yep, it's cancer, it's cancer, it's cancer. If it's bad, I'll move back up to the Gold Coast to be closer to family. If it's not and they can just go in, cut it out and I'm done with, I would have stayed down in New South Wales. For sure. Unfortunately, <laughs> it mm. ended up being pretty bad. So when you got the diagnosis, the hard word, hey look, this is 100% what it is, we now know, what was your initial reaction apart from perhaps the obvious we can empathize as best we can, but you never can truly know until you're in that position where someone delivers that. And a lot of people, it is their worst fear. What is, I mean, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, what is that like? What goes through your head? Is it delayed? Is it disbelief? Well, my personal reaction was because I was already preparing myself for this worst news and mm. I was already planning on things to do depending on the severity of the news. Uh, excuse me. When I got told, yes, it was still that massive shock, like, oh, crap, I now have cancer. Mm. But at the same time, because I also, I only had my older brother there. Like, my parents were stuck up here and on the Gold Coast because of COVID at the time as yeah, well. not the most ideal time, yeah. No. So I had my mum on the phone and... I pride myself in this. I was holding myself together. I was listening to what the doctors were saying and I was strong. I was being strong. I was like, yep, no worries. Okay, sweet. Let's deal with it, yeah. Let's deal, yeah, let's deal with it. And then I heard my stepdad on the other end of the phone tell my mum, he's going to be okay. We'll get through this. And then I heard my mum sniff. Waterworks. Damn. Yeah, and understandable. Then, yeah, as soon as I heard my mum cry, my stepdad try and help my mum, that's when the waterworks started, that's when it really sank in. hit me, because I probably would have been not fine, but I would have been okay trying to deal with it and get through it as mm. best as I could, mm. but hearing and seeing the reaction of my family, that's what really triggered. kind of triggered crap, this mm. is 100% serious and could potentially be life-threatening mm. and you 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 do worry for your family yeah because you, you almost take this secondary approach to yourself where you go well yeah it's shit for me but i'll deal with it but yeah. we don't realize the effect it has on the people who love us yeah uh, and and what they can have to deal with in terms of the trauma as well which i'm sure we'll, we'll get into so skipping forward a little bit because how old were you as well when that what happened? 24. It was 24, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. 24. So, skipping forward about three weeks, because nothing really happened between that time. Was there any, uh, after that, I imagine, you're like, okay, what's the protocol? What are we doing? What's the, no, what's the plan of action? Um, it was basically, as soon as they told me, in that meeting, as soon as they told me the severity, and that I will need surgery possibly chemo, but definitely radiation. Mm -hmm. In my mind, I just went into action mode. Yeah. All right. You just want to problem solve. Yeah. It's that bad. I will tell my landlord, because I still had time on my lease. Yeah. Tell my landlord exactly what's going on. I need to leave in the next couple of weeks. A, because I wanted to get started. Quick smart. Yeah. Let's get straight well, into it. Well, you do, because, I mean, you want to, as soon as possible, mm. be dealing with this, because the more time that elapses, the, the more risky it gets, yeah. I, I imagine. And plus, I had to do the two weeks quarantine because of COVID. Yeah. 
So I wanted to get up here as quick as possible. Yeah. So within three weeks, I had packed up my house. I had moved into my ex's at the time's parents' house because we're all still really close. It's good. Um, and then a few days after I moved in their house, I was driving up here. I was on my way up. Yeah. So six and a half hour drive. Did it all in one, not one big hit. We stopped off to get food. And yeah, yeah. That. But um, there's also, I had my dog, a beautiful little Staffy Cross. She Which needed... I actually want to talk about that because I know she was like a massive yeah. pillar of strength throughout that time. Yeah. And I do believe animals have healing quality. So I'm, I'm very yeah. much um, across that. I, and I could see from what you were posting on social and, you know, some of the things that were reading between the lines. Their yeah. energy is invaluable at times like that. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, got up here, two weeks quarantine, which I felt like a king. I, I, people listening, I don't know if you have been through quarantine for the two weeks, but personally, I felt like a king. I was laid up in bed, not doing anything, playing Xbox, getting my meals bought to me and left out by my door by my family because they couldn't come into my room because A, I had to self-quarantine. B, they didn't want to bring in any extra sicknesses or bugs that would hinder my treatments. So what they'd do is they'd open the door, go dinner, put it down by the door, and then say, love you, and walk away. Yeah. And then I'd do the same. I'd get up, open the door, put the empty tray down, tell them that I've finished, they come take my tray. It was like having three butlers. It was great. <laughs> Absolutely great. I'm glad you found the silver lining there, my friend, because <laughs> a lot of people will be going, it was not great being trapped in a box. But I think that at this point, uh, your level of gratitude would have been much higher yeah. than most people's based on the news that you'd been given. Yeah. Which I think, again, we're, we're probably, it's very obvious point, we'll allude to, to that when you've been given and been through what you've been through, it's yeah. very much, you look at life, I imagine, very differently. And but, then, um, um, yeah, continuing So, on. two weeks worth of that. In the end, I did start getting bored because my games were getting old. <laughs> <laughs> too good at them, mate. Yeah, yeah, too good. Being a gamer. But, um, yeah, so the two weeks went by, and then it was straight into it, really. So, five weeks of radiation therapy and I'll explain the difference between that and was chemo. That, that'd be good. I'd appreciate that. Um, so the plan of action was before surgery, try and radiation to what reduce the size, shrink the size, so they could get a better like margin Scoop. around it. Right. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Um, Less so, trauma to the body from a, yeah. from a surgical intervention. Yeah. Okay. So five weeks of so twenty-five sessions, five weeks. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it only takes 10 minutes, top, minimum. 10, 15, maybe 20. So before you go into your radiation, you have an MRI so they can pinpoint exactly where it is. And then you get tattoos. Now, no, they're not the fun ones like this or the scripts. They're just little tiny, tiny pencil dots. So they, they lay down on a MRI machine and you go into, they put you into a position which will give you the best angle to attack the tumour or the cancer, whatever, you, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then what they do is they mark three dots, well I had three dots, I had one here, so one waist, right there and one there. I'm one on the opposite. Yeah. yeah. And it's just a little black dot. And um, that basically, every time you go in for your radiation, they put you in that position and they line the machine up with all those dots. So every single time- It's precise. It's perfect and exactly the same as the one before. Yeah. Standardization, yeah. yeah. And they make a mold so that you don't have to constantly hold a weird position. You're in a mold and it's comfortable. Yeah. I think those old people were loving that, by the way. 
There's a couple of elderly people, God bless them, just uh, watching Ryan there as he was standing in front of the camera. The people listening, they were like, what is he doing? <laughs> oh, don't worry. The other day I was um, a little bit off topic doing a Cert 4 in hospitality. Yes. And I had to do videos and explain stuff while we had customers in the restaurant. Yes. And they were all looking at me like, what's he doing? So yeah. I had to like, it was like using hand signals for deaf people. It's like, and, it's like Pictionary. Yeah. Anyway, back to radiotherapy. So radiation therapy, what it is, is it's a way to shrink or if the cancer's small enough to kill off the cancer as well. Right. So they do this thing, they mold you, put you in a mold, and it's this big circle machine that spins around. So it's not, it's like an MRI in some respects, but different because it oscillates kind of, around you. Yeah. Yeah. And um, basically it shoots radiation into that localized area what, once they put in all their parameters in the computer. And does it find the tattoo? Or is it as in that's just a marker for them? That's just a marker for them. Right. So they can line up the machine. And then it just distributes it across that panel or that specific yeah. area. And yeah. once they've put it in, it shoots in the area that they've put in. Right. The tattoos are just a marker to get you in that perfect position. Fair enough. So they're hitting the same spot as before. Makes sense. So basically, you're in it for 10 minutes. It spins, you around, spins around you a couple of times, goes one way, comes back the other, and then goes back again a little bit. How long uh, for your procedure, roughly? Mine was about 15 minutes. Okay, right. Yeah, so you go to hospital, you sit down, get changed into your nice little gown, the very fashionable. Oh, the big J cloths? Yeah. Big fashionable doctor's gowns. And then for me, unfortunately, because of where the cancer was, yeah. I had to be completely naked underneath. Oh, right, fair enough. And I also had to reef my private parts to the side. Yeah. Because I only needed 5% of that whole entire five weeks of radiation therapy, yeah. if five, only 5% five of that hit my Balls. my genitals, yeah. I'd be infertile. Yeah, which makes sense. Yeah, so a little bit I missed out before I had to do all this. They weren't going to let me start this procedure until I had frozen some of my sperm. Which is, you know, to be fair, good on their part yeah. to even like to acknowledge that and actually give you the benefit yeah. because then you can 100% know okay well this you know it should the worst happen or even in the future something happens yeah. you can actually a lot of people are doing that now anyway yeah so, so probably not a bad idea yeah I had to do that and then they were letting me start the procedure yeah fair enough so five weeks of that so like I said Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday to and from hospital Half an hour max, getting there, having my treatment, going home. Any pain, any side effects during, after, with the radiation yeah. therapy, apart from obviously what so, you just mentioned? It depends. Everyone's different? Everyone is different. Their bodies react differently to the radiation. But the main common side effects, it's like a really, really bad sunburn. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. You, like over time, it's not, after the first one, it's not there, but after you've constantly had it, after two weeks I started to get it, it was just sore, the skin started to peel. Tender. Yeah. Any and, topical therapies you put on? Uh, they or, just, or you just you got They gave it. me, it was like a kind of um, a mixture of like, I'm not sure if it was bepanthum and another cream. I was going to say bepanthum, that's a belt of that. Mm. It was like a mixture between bepanthum and another cream and just rub that on. Yeah. Keep it nice and moisturized, but not wet. Yeah, fair enough. And just wasn't allowed in the sun. Yeah, obvious reasons. For obvious reasons, yeah. And I wasn't allowed to go swimming. Fair enough. Because the chlorine would react to, react to it and possible chance for infection. Five weeks of that ended up by the fifth week Fatigue had set in because some of it, sometimes it's really early in the morning, other times midday. It was just the schedule was all over the shop. Yeah, they're fitting you in. Yeah. yeah. 
where, with everyone else who's also getting treatment. They tried to keep it me. similar, but it just depended on the amount of people they had that day, the kinds of people. Everyone was, it's, it's weird. And I'll explain this as well when I get to the chemo stage, but you think that people having to go through this, they'd just be sitting there like yeah. doom and gloom. I've never met happier people. Well, I was gonna, this is one of the areas I wanted to talk to you about, some of the people that you'd met during mm. your time. I, I've been fortunate enough, I've only had surgery once and it was for, for wisdom teeth, etc. No, no, you carry on. Oh yeah, no, I was all edited around it. Well, I appreciate that, thank you. No, you carry on, just do a dance in the background if you want. That's all right. Join in. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, for people listening, just one of the cleaners there was wondering whether she could walk past, but no, it's all part of the ambiance. Very thoughtful of her. Um, uh, wisdom teeth, so you know, nothing major, but even that, because I went, uh, I had to get them all out, and they said, you know, it's best to go under. Anyway, I went to see a specialist, and I was sat around, and it was a day surgery center, so there was a lot of people getting different procedures, and you know, me, never been a fan of those, you know, surgical arenas yeah. or, you know, needles and all that. I've always been in fear, and I've had to overcome all these things, hence fearless training is one of the reasons. So, sat there with some of those people like you said they were so like i was with and it was the the elderly people who comforted mm. me the most they were so funny i remember there was two particular ladies and you know they're like what are you in for love they were like your little your mum and i was just like oh this and like you'll be fine is this we're in here you know and i'm like what are you guys and they're telling me and i'm like shit are you and they're like oh we're fine and they just think you know like the attitude of people like that even the effect that that has on the room, mm. on the environment, on the tension, it, it made me feel so much more comfortable. And then obviously the health professionals themselves, um, yeah. you really have a deeper respect for, for the, the people there creating the environment, but obviously the, the practitioners too, who are a bit more lighthearted. Yeah, you know, we're gonna get it done, we're serious, but let, let's try and have a laugh. Let's not, you know, be an optimist rather than a pessimist. So yeah, um, yeah I mean, please do share but, your um, experiences with, with some of the people you met. I imagine you met some pretty inspirational people where you think, fuck, if you can do that, I can do this. Yeah, and I'll get to that a little bit later through my chemo because that's when I really struggled For sure. on the mental side. The radiation, it was mainly just talking to them and they'd come in and they'd be like, oh yeah, this is my 53rd week. It's like, Jesus. 53rd week? No, yeah, no. I'm only having five weeks, yeah. like 25 sessions. Shit. Like, wow. And You're like, this is nothing. Yeah. So that helped me through that stage quite a lot but then came the waiting game again mm. and that's what really destroys the mental side of you yeah because it's you just it's the unknown isn't it yeah and i had to wait six six to twelve weeks before i could have my surgery <clears throat> oh excuse me so that that uh, surgery was always on the table yeah. no matter what the radiation was just as we talked about minimalized yeah yeah okay so surgery was always on the card radiation was pretty much always on the card because the tumor was too big for them to be able to go in and get a, a good positive uh, margin around it yeah because and There's I'll a get lot to this going a little on bit in, later. That, in yeah. that part of the leg as well yeah. I'll get to this bit soon but they wanted to get as much muscle around it that hadn't been affected yeah so they didn't leave anything behind. Yeah, and also recovery could be optimized yeah. rather than taking too much. So I'll get to that when I explain my surgery in a, in a second. Yeah. So I had to wait, I think it was six to 12 weeks mm. to let the radiation settle. Do its thing. Because um, that pretty much killed off quite a lot of the cells around that area too. Just destroyed them. Yeah. So I had to kind of let my body settle down recover a little bit. Build back the immunity, yeah. all of those things, all the cellular health. Yeah, so, and then came surgery, August the 17th. And my word was I crapping myself. Yeah, for sure. Never had surgery, haven't had my wisdom teeth yet. Oh, there you go, that was like your first one then. Yeah. yeah I get the feeling. First ever surgery, and I was crapping myself. It's fear of the unknown. Also, I had a big, big fear of needles. Massive fear of needles. I couldn't look. Even if I was getting a jab, I can't look. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have felt sick. Yeah, I get it. Wouldn't have fainted. Just that. Yeah, I oh, get I'm it. Gonna it's throw that up. like nauseous mm. feeling. I get it. It's in the pity of stomach. So, 
I was trying to be as happy and as positive as possible, as I always have been through life. And um, yeah, so once again, I've got my nice little shower cap. Um, as you do. Paper socks, paper undies, which I'm glad I didn't actually crap myself because you would have been able to see. Yeah. And the nice doctor's gown again. <laughs> Sitting there with these big, long, high, knee-high socks that are compression compression socks. So, because I would have been off my feet for a long time, these circulation socks stop you from getting blood clots, and it helps the circulation through your legs. For sure, as you'd know with yeah with gym. So, I've got about six pairs of those socks. I was going to say you probably got a collection. Yeah, <laughs> I got about six pairs of them, and they. They're good socks, but at the same time, they're the most annoying socks as well because they've got a little hole by your toes. Oh, right. Like, and it goes around like the knuckles of your toes just before oh, your toenails. Yeah, yeah. So if you move wrong, your big toe like goes poing and sits out on top of the sock and it's, oh. <laughs> it's the little things, isn't it? That was annoying with those socks and not being able to sit up and bend over after I had my surgery, which I'll get to. It was just a pain in the ass. I had to ding the nurse and they went, what's wrong, Ryan? I'm like, can you fix me socks? <laughs> <laughs> Again, yes. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, so the surgery, what they did was I, they cut me open about... Six uh, inches? Yeah. Yeah. Fro above the knee. And then... They go up? It's gone, the, the incision's gone from there all the way up into my groin, into the crease, so like right next to my genitals. Yeah, yeah. So it's... So the coccyx bone. Yeah. Yeah. So... Where they would measure a suit, well, almost, probably a bit higher, but they check right in there. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got this massive scar going pretty much down to my knee, and then two dots for tubes. Yeah. So they opened me up, Went in, did the, ins did the surgery, got out all the tumour, and I'm pretty sure they took out, correct me if I'm wrong here, we've got four abductor muscles on one side, is it? The, yeah, there's quite a few in the leg. Yeah. There's many. Uh, they took... And then they all split into different arenas. So, like, within the quadricep, you've got four main muscles, mm. and then they're all broken down. You have more stabilised muscle, stabilisation muscles that come up, like iliopsoas, yeah. that come up into more the core area as well. But did they... Do you mean they, um, they didn't take them all out, but they would have trimmed them, taken parts of them out, cut them, severed them? Oh, no, they actually took two main, abductor muscles. Oh, it's probably the stabilisation parts of the adductors, yeah. And practically... I can't show you because I can't undress. My, Give the old people a show again. Yeah. <laughs> my right leg in the quad would be is, like half the size. Yeah, it's half the size of my left leg. Yeah. And you can see when I don't have, uh, when I show, when I, well, I won't show you. When you've got shorts on. You can see the divot in my leg. Like it, my leg comes up and then it divots in. Instead and then of having that out. wider part yeah. towards the groin, it comes in. So, I was thinking that was the end. I was like, sweet, they've got the tumour out. I can start recovering. I was in hospital for two weeks. Did you see the tumour, by the way? They show you no. at the end? No, they don't show you? No. Did, did you ask? I, I was on oh, fentanyl and ketamine. I was on the, the highest yeah. um, pain meds. You were tripping. I was out cold, apparently. Did, were you actually, were you not like, when you came back to, because also I found the anaesthetist thing quite weird, and I know you're on a completely different level here, but I was, in part of me was like, it's not gonna work, I'm not gonna fall asleep, I'm gonna wake up. That, I was I, the fear in that You know what I, I mean? In, yeah. And, and uh, the, I must admit, I had a really good anaesthetist, I won't go into it, but he was a fucking legend. He made me feel mm. so comfortable, and he was a crack up. Um, but yeah, and then you, all of a sudden when you, you come to, you're like, fuck it, it's a, it's a jaded perception of time, especially when you've never been through it. When you came to, were you just out of it for, like, were you still in kind of a haze for a long time? Yeah, I was in a haze, and this is a funny story, and I know my brother's friend, one of my brother's friends doesn't watch any of this stuff because they're just not into it, but yeah. um, my brother, he, 
he called obviously once my mum told him that I was at surgery. And apparently, because my mum and my sister were at the hospital with me. Yeah. Apparently, me and my brother were having a conversation, but it was gibberish. Ah. My mum and my sister could not understand a word I was saying or what my brother was saying because I was high off, obviously, the pain meds. Yeah. Apparently, my brother was high off marijuana. Fair enough. <laughs> there you go. He, but, was, uh, he was living vicariously for yeah. you. <laughs> but we were both understanding each other, apparently, having this massive conversation. But to my mum and my sister, it was gibberish. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, woke up thinking, well, once I came to, thinking, great, sweet. What, how long um, was it between the surgery and then when you came conscious again? Uh, so my, I went in for surgery and I came out eight hours later. Right. And then it took another hour and a half for me to wake up. Right. I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the next day, like, it, they didn't let me re fully recover. Well, they did. Like they let me have a day's worth of rest, but then they were like, all right, come on, let's see if you can put weight on your, on your leg yet. That is not a bad thing, though. No. and Because a lot of people, they don't do the, the it won't go hmm. into this, but the, with the recovery, a lot of the physio stuff, sometimes you'll get neglected, and you have to, without causing distress, you need to get back on the horse, so to speak, yeah. ASAP, because otherwise the body, the muscle memory will not return, amongst other things. They gave me this big, big walk, it looked like a, the head of a treadmill, just without the treadmill. Oh, like the big frame? Yeah, the frame. Brought that out, and it also had a seat, so if my leg got tired, I could sit down. Yeah. So they brought it out and said, come on, get up. Not that forceful. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, but... <laughs> just generalisation. Come on, let's go. Yeah. Go come for on. a walk around the block. Kicked me out of bed. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so got up, and they were surprised that I was able to walk as good as I could. Yeah despite having all that just taken out of me. and So I was pretty much starting recovery straight away. Yes. And then unfortunately, after the two weeks of recoup and recovery in hospital, they sent me home. And I had two tubes coming out of my leg. Yes. That into was a little the, bag. The drainage. The and that was to drain. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so unfortunately I got an infection and they were kind of planning for this because of the radiation. Right. Back in the hospital, reopened me up but. to a hand size so they could get in and dig out all the inf Yeah, it's gross. Fuck. Yeah. Where, the infection was obviously like pus and shit. Yeah. Yeah, fucking hell. Just big fluid build-ups in, the, and they couldn't just leave the pipe, the drains in. There wasn't enough. Because no, there was enough. Yeah. But it was in different pockets. Oh fuck me. Yeah. Isn't yeah? I mean, I'm I'm just always incredibly fascinated with the human body, and just people who have been through this. You can always, I always sort of think back. Imagine the first people to go through this. Yeah. Like fuck me, pioneers, you know, in it, without knowing it, so yeah. that you know, people like us in the future, we can just keep getting better and better and better and better and better at it, so. But anyway, continue on. Well, the doctor, my surgeon said 40 years ago, they would have just cut my whole leg off. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. Mm. I mean, and that was the, and imagine the painkillers then, fuck me. Mm. So, after recovering from the infection and the second surgery, that was a bit quicker, because I knew what to do, and it wasn't as big. Plus they sent me home with a thing called a vac dressing, a vac pump. It's basically this pump that I had to carry around 24 seven with a canister on the side. And it's this dressing that went over the wounds and it sucks everything to the surface. So it like sucks like your muscles and all the clean tissue upwards. Yeah. So it doesn't heal sideways in. It healed from the bottom up. That is fucking amazing. Yeah. So instead of having one line of a scar, I've got a line and then it comes out like that, comes back in, then continues as a line. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. And I can send you, I won't send you the graphic pictures, but I can yeah. send you a couple of photos yeah. if you want to put on 
when you upload Yeah, whatever this. you're comfortable with, my friend, for yeah. people who are interested. There's a couple of graphic photos, which will be up to your discretion to put on. Yeah, sure. But, um, yeah, and then, so once that had healed, that was another 12 weeks, and they weren't sure to put me through chemo because I wasn't fully healed from the surgery. But it was at the 12 week mark, I had to. Yeah. Um, so at this point, obviously, you were on painkillers yeah. most of the time, adjusting to life, was, just being very unpredictable at this point. At one stage, I was taking two lots of Endone, two lots of Panadol, two lots of um, Coloxal and Senna, which is a laxative. So, because the painkillers were they, they stop you from, yeah. stopping me from going to the toilet. Yeah. And then at the same time, I was drinking a drink called Movicol. Absolutely disgusting. It is. I've heard of it. Disgusting. Tastes like plastic. Ugh. Helps you digest and go to the toilet. So... What was nutrition like at this point, out of interest? Nutrition was pretty good. Were there any... Uh, recommendations apart from the obvious quality they just said food. stick to a healthy diet yeah um and plus my parents and my younger sister they're all vegan vegetarians yeah so it was always constant they're always sneaking in they were oh here's his lasagna me thinking it was a lamb or beef lasagna yeah. smash into it ended up being lentil lasagna yeah yeah oh, because well. i was on so much different medications i didn't, didn't care and no. yeah for sure but um, yeah, so nutrition wise was pretty good. My parents were constantly mm. bringing me in. Because that will definitely have a bearing. We won't yeah. get into it, but the nutrition, the medical system is yeah, sometimes my parents backwards of what people would think. We're constantly bringing me in food. And like, are you hungry? Like, yeah. Every 20 minutes we're coming in. Are you hungry? Are yeah. you okay? Do you need things? Yeah. Got a little bit annoying, but at the same time, it's your parents. They yeah. just want to care. Be better to be um, yeah. over assertive than, than under cared for, that's for sure. So, after the, because I did have a skin graft as well, and that slipped my mind. Yeah. Just because they wanted to heal. The, Where did they take that from? Just, just here on the side of my leg, okay. next to the scar, and then yeah. just, okay, well. Because they were thinking about taking muscle from... Glute. My glute. Yeah. And putting it in there yeah. to fill the gap. Yeah. But in the end, they just did the back dressing to heal it as good as it can, and then once it was to a certain point, to see the skin graft. Yeah. We'll be able to build those muscles back up. Pardon? We'll be able to build those muscles back up from their, from what uh, they've... Um, not... Uh, what do you say now? Uh, hypothesized? Or is it, you know, they've actually taken out completely two um, muscles that cannot be replaced? Pretty sure they've taken out the complete muscle. Yeah. So you'd have to basically compensate by trying to build the other muscles yeah. bigger. And that's what I've been degree. doing in the gym. Like, trying to... I'm still doing the main exercises, mm -hmm. obviously, but just trying to build out the outer side of my quad mm -hmm. and compensate for the muscles I've lost on the inside. Mm -hmm. So after the skin graft have healed, this is constant. Like I, other than the breaks I had in between, like the required breaks, I was non-stop in treatments. So the five weeks, like, as soon as I finished the quarantine, five weeks of radiation and then I had the breaks I had to and then it was a surgery and I was the surgeries then it was the breaks on the surgeries and then it was what I'm about to get into the chemotherapy which I went for four or five months yeah six cycles so it's been non-stop for a year but yes I could go out once I was feeling okay but that was once in a blue moon and I was never really able to enjoy well, no one could because of COVID, but... Yeah. Gem the simplicities yeah. of life, yeah. So, chemo came because... Excuse me. In the surgery, they left what they called a positive margin, which was right up against the pelvic bone because mm -hmm. they couldn't get it out. Yeah. So, they're like, all right, we're going to do aggressive chemotherapy to the point where you will be constantly sick, you'll lose all your hair, and you may end up in hospital. I was like, great, 
<laughs> what's yeah, what's going through your mind like, once again when someone says that to you? I mean, I think one one you know good thing about that is the honesty. I'd rather someone yeah. be, hey, look, just tell me how it is. Like, let's not fuck around. Yeah, my, you know? all my doctors, my nurses, my oncologists, they've all been brilliant. They just kept on giving it to me straight. So and you they want. were apologizing to me for putting me through it. And I was like, don't apologize. Like, it's you're it, helping me. Yeah, this is <laughs> I it, should be thanking you. <laughs> it's what it takes. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so... When they told me that, I was like, great, more treatment. And this is probably going to be the worst part of it. And it was. Um, first week, the first week of chemotherapy, my God, was, it wasn't the toughest, believe you me. But it was immensely tough. Going in, sitting in a room. Oh, sorry, before that I had to have another surgery. Yeah. And if you want to feel it, I can show this to you guys if you want. Oh. See that? Yeah. Do you want to feel it? Run your finger across there. What is that? It's what you call the porter calf, and I'll just show you if you can see it, that little lump there. There you go. It's like, uh, it looks like protruding nipples. Yeah, and you can see the cord. Wow, okay, so what, what does that do? So. Basically, what a porta cath is, is this little device yes. that you can have, which instead of, especially in my case, because I was in for four days in a row getting chemotherapy. Yes. So instead of getting cannula after cannula after oh, cannula yeah. and the, the, yeah. <laughs> may yeah, chance yeah, yeah. of collapsing your vein. Yeah. Oh, I'm cringing just thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. It was basically... they. Empathy. Put the needle in that little porter calf thing. Oh, yeah. Much and better. you could leave it in for the four days. Yeah. And then after you've had your last treatment, they take it out. Yeah. And that goes basically to your main artery in your neck, just here. Woo. <laughs> so it can go to your heart quicker, so your heart can pump it around the body faster. And it can do what it needs to do. Yeah. Yeah. So I was in, for my chemotherapy, I was in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday for six hours. Jesus Christ. So two hours sat worth- Sat down? Sat down, yeah. C c were you reading, playing games? Were you, did, they I mean, had have the you TV. got the capacity to do that at that point? They had the, the normal hospital TVs. I took in my laptop, but the first week I was on my laptop. Yeah. Just watching movies with the crap Wi-Fi. <laughs> Heads up. Um, so, should have had the podcast on, mate. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so two hours worth of pre-meds and then four hours worth of the actual chemo. Yeah. So you're just sitting there basically doing nothing. Talking to the other people because there's four seats a pod. Okay, well, thank... I mean, I say that would be a godsend because yeah. you'd be going around the bend yeah. with, Unless they with, put you, with your own thoughts. Yeah, there was a couple of rooms where you had a bed. Yeah. And that was by yourself. Yeah, no, you'd rather be surrounded by people. Because like, you can yeah. empathise and you just sort of get through it together, don't you? Yeah, so there was ten pods with four seats in each. And is it just basically there's a, almost like a, um, a drip there? Yeah. And, so that's it's, a, and it's just that's the chemo coming in? Yeah. Yeah, right. Basically just that's so it. people can kind it's of grasp the it. drip pole and wherever you get a cannula or the porter cath. I imagine porter cath is for people who need the more extreme treatments. Well, some people get the porter cath because especially the older people, their veins are more brittle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's sense. just easier. Um, can they take that out later? Yeah, you can have this in for 10 years. Wow, and they just whip it out, whip it in? Yeah, you go Pretty in, get put amazing. under, they just do a little incision above and it sits in your muscle. Amazing, amazing. I'm cringing thinking about it a little bit, but. And you, I actually need to ask my doctor because I'm getting a call from him tomorrow. Yeah. About, because you do need to get these flushed. Which makes sense. I, act, I haven't since my last chemo, which was the 5th of March. Yeah. Which is bad with me, but I'm gonna ask my doctor when I need to go. Yeah. If I should go get it flushed because it could get infected. Well, that's it. You don't want it to clog up if it's attached yeah. to a main artery. 
So that's a godsend. Um, so yeah, six hours for the four days in hospital. The first week, it was tough because I'm getting chemotherapy. I'm, at this stage, I'm 25 now, because I had my birthday in December. Well, actually, no, I hadn't. I was still 24. Um, yeah, I was sitting there, I'm 24, and I'm getting aggressive chemotherapy. Yeah, you're thinking, what the fuck's going on? Second week came along. I was like, because uh, you had the week of chemo and then two weeks mm. rest, week of chemo, so on and so forth. So I'd have the chemotherapy and that completely knocks you, knocks you on your ass. It kills all your white blood cells. So your white blood cells help fight off bacteria and infections and diseases. So you lose all those. So if you get the common cold, you can die, pretty much, if you're going through chemo, because it kills off everything. Red blood cells, they drop, so... You lose all of your immunity. Yeah. Your fight. immune system's gone. Yeah. That's the, the main side yeah. effect, yeah. Platelets, I had to have blood transfusions, platelet infusions, because I would cut myself and it wouldn't clog. Hmm. It would just bleed and bleed and bleed. I had a nosebleed for uh, three hours. Jesus. Yeah. Which I ended up in hospital because uh, it just wouldn't stop. Yeah. S so, that, was the f that wasn't the first week, or that didn't happen in the first week. That happened during the chemo. But the first week was tough. The week after the first week of chemo, didn't eat. Um, Slept 24-7. If I did eat, I'd throw it up within the next five minutes. So just complete and utter death. Mm. That's what I felt like. Second week came along, I knew what to expect. So I went in my laptop, my earbuds, talked for a little bit, put my, put my music on, fell asleep. And that's what I did the second week. And then the week after that, I knew what to expect. And at this stage, I was still on like 10 pills a day. Mm. My painkillers, so I was still having some pains. And then all my medications for the chemo. It leaves you in a very vulnerable situation when yeah. you're on all those drugs, isn't it? I mean, and even just juggling. The, yeah. Like you said, you're on drugs and then you're on drugs for the other drugs to counteract the drugs you're taking. It's like, oh, Jesus Christ. I mean, yeah. your stomach's doing bloody somersaults. Also, I was stabbing myself at least, um, well, once every three weeks yeah. to help the platelets and the blood cells come yeah. back. Well, like what, an immunity booster or something? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can't remember what it was called, but literally just jabbing the stomach on the fifth day of chemo, they call it. Yeah. It's the day after you finish the treatment. Yeah. So then I was trying to eat again in that first week after the second week. May sound a little bit confusing, so I'm going first, second weeks. It'll sort itself out. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come together. Yeah. So, what I'll say is after the second cycle of chemo, mm -hmm. that'll make it a bit easier for you guys watching. The first week after the second cycle, I was, wasn't getting as sick because I knew when to eat and when not to. You, you sort of learn as you yeah. go. Yeah. Third week, third cycle came along, I was halfway through. That was when it, I was at my lowest. I was constantly in hospital. I was, because if your temperature gets to 38, usually you'd stay at home, nurse it, let it come down. But when you're going through chemo, you have to go to hospital. Doesn't matter if you're feeling, if you're feeling healthy, like, it's just a, yeah, you better yeah, it's save a for the sorry. Yeah. And you, you, your body temperature is a massive sign so of So as soon as you hit 38 and you had the tiniest, tiniest little hint of a fever in hospital. Yeah. Then I was in hospital for nearly the two weeks I was meant to be out recovering. Yeah. I was in hospital. So yeah, once it hit that third week, I actually just wanted to end my life. Yeah. It got to the point where 
I'd had enough. I wanted to end my life. And that was, I hadn't felt like that in years. Yeah. In years. And that was tough. Was it but because of the pain that you were going through? It was the pain. The constant monotony of everything? The constant sickness. The constant thought of, will the chemo work? Will it not? The thought of potentially, yes, I've got the frozen sperm, but now the chemo may make me infertile as well. Yeah. The thought of potentially not being able to have kids naturally. Yeah. Just live life. Just live life. I'm now constantly going to have to have checkups for the rest of my life. Yes, it would go from being every three months, then it would go every six months, and then it would go every year. Yeah. But living in the, the constant fear of... What if? Every little pain I get, is that the cancer coming back? Yeah. Is it, is it something else? Is it worse? Yeah, you can imagine. You just, it primes the brain yeah. to look for and identify, oh, you know, is it something bad because of what you've been through? It's hard to find the light in times like that, I imagine so, very, very character building. Yeah, at the end of it, I, at the end of that third week, I was like, no. I either stop the treatment, yeah. and I'll just live with it, and if, I, if it hasn't killed the cancer, I'll just live as long as I can until it kills me, or I'm gonna knock myself off. Yeah. But, having saying that, I looked at my family, I looked, that these other people that were going through the same situation. And I thought to myself, you know what, I can do this. My family's been through a lot, and we've managed to get through it. And let's just push through it. I want to live a life. I need to be here for my family. And I can't let something like this destroy me. I think that's where it comes back to again, the strength outside of yourself, because yeah. even when you feel like giving up, you've got to think about the people who are left behind. Yeah. It's not fair on them. So it's sometimes, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you go, you know what, I can't do it for me right now, but I'm going to do it for my family and, and perhaps even the people around you, whether it's even your dog, you know, the other people in the yeah. hospital, even the people, the medical staff have looked after you, you know, because some people don't have family. So yeah. they've got to draw on different strengths and energies. That was another thing, my dog Misty. She was an integral part of me when I found out. They just know, eh? They just know. When I came home, she, excuse me, went, did her usual thing, jumping around, peed herself because she was so excited to see me. <laughs> but I was just like, hey, hey, and I was really flat. Yeah. And I just went and sat on the couch and instead of trying to play and everything, she just jumped up on the couch forced her head underneath my arm onto my lap and just laid there. Yeah. And I was like, she definitely knows. Oh, they have a wicked ability to sense the human emotion. And yeah, she, and then that was another thing that I was like, I can't leave my Misty girl behind. That's yeah. my kid. Yeah. Like, even though she's a dog, that's my... Well, that's the closest that's thing. That's my though. kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like that. So I was like, no. Nah. All right. So what I did, me and my friend went shopping and there was this full pineapple outfit and I'll send you the photos that so you can put it up as well so <laughs> they can see. Pineapple socks, pineapple shorts, pineapple shirt, nice. pineapple bucket hat. Nice, do it. I wore that to in the, my fourth week of the chemo. And then I became known as the outfit guy because I came in dressed in a flamingo one. Hey. Came in dressed as, there was another like flamingo it. one as well. Making it fun. And... can you do like a cowboy or something? There was... A watermelon one. Watermelon. Oh, so the theme was fruit. Yep. <laughs> right. And then Australia Day, I came in dressed as a bogan. My friends, because I'd lost all my hair at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My friend's dad gave me this really big black wig. Oh, you beauty. I wore that, wore my um, See You in the Northern Territory hat. <laughs> which didn't go down well with a couple of people because it does spell the C word on it. And then I wore beer shorts and thongs nice. and a wife beater singlet. 
Did you draw on a mozzie? No. <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't draw draw on a moustache, but chopper reed. <laughs> so there was that one, and then there was another outfit. I can't remember what I wore. But I got known as the outfit guy, and I'd walk in even if I was wearing plain clothes. People that I hadn't talked to yet, yeah. they go, "Oh my god, you're the guy that wears all the outfits, aren't you?" And I'm like, "Yep," yeah, because I had six pictures up on this tree of life wall. That's great. Where people write down their experiences and stuff, and I'll I'll send you the photos as well, like I said. Yeah. And um, yeah, I had six photos, and people would look at it and. That's what else got me through, knowing that I was making other people's days bright Yeah. in that sense. And making the nurses' day, because the nurses have got to deal with this 24-7. Like having people come in that are essentially on their deathbed and like young people like myself coming in that haven't even lived life yet. It's hard. It's very hard. They were very upbeat and happy nurses, but you could tell it, would take the, it was taking its toll on them. Yeah, they... Uh, they... They go through the ringer. Yeah. They go through the ringer. They absolutely loved it. Well, for them, it's just yeah. bringing a different element yeah. to it. Just even if it's just a moment for a smile, you know, a bit of a laugh. It's we, we need to do this, especially in times of, you know, yeah. death, because ultimately, you know, there's no point in just focusing on the negatives. It does not help yeah. the matter. Uh, you know, you got to be realistic, but you've and got to somehow get through it. Like I said earlier, with the radiation, the people there, like. The day unit for chemotherapy, you'd walk in and you'd think it would all be doom and gloom. Like people just sitting there with their heads down, upset. But no, you'd walk in, you'd sit down and you'd just talk to them, just be like, how's it going? And they're like, oh yeah, not too bad. How are you? It's like, yeah, good, thanks yourself. Ah oh, yeah, just getting this stupid stuff put in my body again. Yeah, I imagine you, know? you get to know quite a few people. Yeah. It becomes a bit of a community in many respects. Yeah, and actually, Tomorrow, going out for a beer with someone I met there, um, Mark, who's won't see this, but he's he's a top bloke. He's a trooper. Um, poor bloke, but um, yeah, he came up to me when I went to the Warriors event, and we had a big talk. Got his number, and we're going out for a beer next week yep. tomorrow. But um, they're just there. They're, if you seem a little bit down, all that—that's what they do. No matter what they're going through, they try and cheer you up yeah so you're going through worse than me but you're trying to cheer me up yeah sometimes there's a coping mechanism as well though mm. to project positivity and happiness onto other people yeah which and inflicts your own self-worth and purpose they are just amazing like the community of the nurses and the patients going through it is yeah. is that community is probably one of the best like the saddest but best communities i've ever been a part of mm. and i'm a part of mm. And oh, the inspiration they gave me was, because I was trying to do that through my outfits for them. Yeah. I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna try and be happy and just be a random idiot. <laughs> in the, I'm young, I can get away with it. Yeah, uh, man, and at that point you sort of, you probably care very little yeah. what people think because your whole social EQ is just completely recalibrated yeah. when you go through something like that. All the things, all those little worries, ah, yeah. that's nothing. And it, you don't even think, it's like, wow, that's not even important anymore yeah. relative at, to what is important. At this point, my whole outlook on life was, you know what, I'm just going to be as positive as I physically can be. I'm just going to be my, be my full natural self and just, just if people don't like it, Fuck well, em. yeah, they can get fucked. Well, you know, you can't please everyone, you know, and people are always going to be offended, mm. even if it's not what we would objectively, yeah, you know, box as offence, and we won't go down that rabbit hole in this day and age. But ultimately, you know, you've you've got to be yourself, yeah, you yeah. know. And I think if you're not hurting anyone, uh, you know, and you, your intentions are well placed, then be yeah. unique, be different. The struggles of it definitely outweighed the positives. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's changed who I am. It's changed my outlook on life. And at the end of the day, I'm still here. Mm. Um, I'm kicking, I'm not kicking goals yet, but um, I'm starting to. I'm back at work, I'm back at gym. 
Unfortunately, I may have to have another surgery, um, which will knock me back, but it will, it will never knock me down. Because after this surgery, I can, if I need it, I can hopefully say that I have kicked cancer's ass and have Boom. survived probably one of the worst. If not the worst. If not the worst diseases. Or at least the, um, probably the largest or highest killing. Yeah. Uh, you know, toxin stressor to the body that, that yeah. we are aware of. Apart from obviously there's acute things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is the one that in some way, shape or form usually takes a lot of good people. Yeah, in a way, I died. Yeah. But it didn't kill me. Yeah, I'm sure parts of you. It's changed who I am for the better. It's changed my outlook on life. And you know what, in those tough times, all you can do is be positive. Mm. Because if you're negative, like I was that first stint at the chemo, it was the worst time in my life. Mm -hmm. The second half of that chemo, when I was just positive and just trying to be happy, I got through it. Mm. It was a struggle, but I got through it. And no matter what life throws at you, you, you can, if you're mentally tough enough, I physically wasn't, but it conditioned my mind to the point that I was. And it is the mind, because the mind yeah. ultimately rules the body. And when the body can't perform, the mind has to take over. But that's very, very much easier said than done in that time. Yeah. And you've kind of inadvertently answered the, some of the questions I wanted to ask you, which was, you know, what were the toughest times of that experience? What were the main takeaways and learnings? You know, who were the people that supported you to the most? And I don't know if you had to kind of summarize specifically was, and it's unfair to kind of null it down to one thing, but for you, apart from what you've already mentioned, was there any main takeaway? Was there any key people or person that was the North Star in all of this? Or maybe it was Misty, the dog, I don't know. And, and then lastly, the triple threat question, and we can, we can segment these up because I know there's a lot in here, but um, you know, what, what advice would you give for people who are also going through what you went through or even if they're not in life, you know what I mean? Like if they're going through their own well, troubles and battles. The toughest by far was the waiting game. And I'm currently going through that at the moment, waiting for these scans to come back. That's the toughest part. Chemo was very, very tough. But I've got to say, mentally, the waiting game and waiting to see if it's worked, waiting to see, waiting to find out, waiting to know. That is the worst because your mind just goes in a big whirlwind. Has it worked? For me it was, has it worked? Is it working? Why am I feeling like this? Why has this happened? Like, why do they need to do this? Why, how? And it just drained me, drained me, drained me. Um, there's not one single person above anyone else that helped me through it. Everyone was immense. My oncologist, Rob Mason, if anyone's going through this and, know, and who's watching and knows Rob Mason, you'd know what I'm speaking about. He's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. All the nurses in the day unit, Absolutely fantastic. Look after you, put you before them. It's, everyone was just, my whole family, they were just supportive to the ends of the earth. Surgeon, all my, sur every, it's just, I've had five different teams of specialists look at me and they've all been fantastic. I've had three different oncology teams, two down here on the Gold Coast one up in the PA in Brisbane, my surgery team up in Brisbane, they were fantastic. All the nurses that looked up at me in Brisbane, down here on the got, it, it's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. And yeah, 
they all can't, I can't thank one more than the other. Mm. Biggest thing I can tell people that are going through the same or similar or have a big struggle in life like this is easier said than done, I know this. Be strong. Mentally, don't let go. Always find a positive in the negative. Just keep that mind up. Be as focused on getting to the end goal and the end outcome as not as fast as possible, as good and as healthy and as best possible. It doesn't matter if it takes you three years, one year, six months, it doesn't matter. Take your time and do it right. Because you don't want to do it quickly, do it wrong, and have to do it all over again. Just be positive, be upbeat. You can do it. I'm nearly at the end of mine. It's been, don't know why I looked at my watch, it's not going to tell me the years. It's a British thing. It's a British, yeah. I was going to say, it's a British, he's done it. Where yeah. are you going, Tenerife? That's a fancy watch. <laughs> When's your birthday, August? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, it, I've been in this battle since... Um, it would have been, what, 2020? Well, I, I found the lump. Or 2019, actually. I found the lump in October 19. Yeah, because it was after, I remember, mm. you were training and I was sort of maybe three months at EMF, I think, because you were in the early days. You were one of the first yeah, clients. Yeah, um, I was struggling with my leg then. Yeah, I remember. I don't know if we thought it was football, yeah. amongst other things. So... Nearly going on two years and I could still go for longer in this. And I will be. I'll be doing this for the rest of my life, checkups. But you know what? I'm gonna, there's a, don't know if any of you like country songs, but there's a country song called Live Like You Were Dying by Tim McGraw. Listen to that because I resonate that song a lot because of the contents of the song. But listen to it, live life, even if you're not going through any struggles and you just feel down, live your life like you were dying. Go, go do some skydiving, go swim in the ocean with the sharks, go, go to Tenerife, go to, go to America, do what you want. Buy those shoes, buy that dress, live your life, do it because one day you never know what's going to happen. It's true. That's probably be a very appropriate way to wrap up what I think has been quite a, an inspirational and sobering podcast, that's for sure. I know it's given me even more sort of humility, you know, groundedness, but then also gratitude as well, which is really big. And, you know, that was one of the things I wanted to allude to was, what, you know, what, what advice would you give to people? And I think it's quite obvious there at the end in terms of, you know, don't wait. Yeah. You just don't know. Yeah, sure, you don't want to rush and go out and just do sporadic things for the sake of it, but really what are the things that you value in life? Yeah. And, you know, maybe you just need that daily dose of reality and yeah. maybe the podcast is it and speaking to people like yourself who can pay that forward, you can always draw on those experiences to go, you know what, maybe not tomorrow, maybe today. Yeah. Because we don't know. We just don't know what's around the bend. Um. Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, but today's a gift. That's why they call it the present. So live, it's the way I'm doing it at the moment. Live for the moment, live for today. Tomorrow's a mystery, you don't know what's going to happen. Don't worry about yesterday, that's the past. You can't change that, you can't predict that, but you can live in that. That's all I can say. Beauty. I appreciate it, my man. And before we go, I like to always ask rapid fire questions. And I'm interested in your answers to these ones based on your experience. These are, they're a bit more fun and lighthearted. My first one is, if you could choose a superpower in life, what would it be and why? And you can make up absolutely anything. I'd actually like fly because if, like, yeah, flying, I could just go, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to Spain. <laughs> There Especially now with COVID, that would be yeah. very handy. <laughs> yeah. Very handy. You know what? I'm no going to go Great Barrier Reef. See you, Gold Coast. <laughs> Don't have to spend money on flights. That's true. 
more money in my pocket to spend. Yeah, and no one needs to need to worry about the self-isolation. Just yeah. bang, straight in there. Yep. All right then. Well, that kind of eliminates another one of the questions <laughs> that I talk about. No, no, it's not a bad thing. No, uh, but the, yeah, which was you know with COVID, you know if you could go anywhere in the world, but flight kind of facilitates that. And moreover, if you could invite three, any three people, and it, this is hard because it will change. So go with your gut instinct on these. Three people around the table for dinner, dead or alive, who would you invite? Ooh. And it is a good one because that's going to sit with Robin you Williams. for the rest of the day. And there'll be more. Robin Williams. Belter. Definitely. Um, Garth Brooks. Um, he's still alive, thank God. He's my favorite, my number one country singer. Favorite artist. Yeah, yep, favorite artist. No one can ever beat him. So Robin Williams, Garth Brooks, and... Oh, probably Jimmy Barnes, because he's also... Jimmy Barnes, what a legend. I just absolutely love him. He's a belter on the mic, <laughs> yeah. that fella. Yeah, he's good though, isn't he? <laughs> I was driving in my car on the way to work the other day. And I just got completely lost in his new song, Flesh and Blood. Yeah. And I was driving both windows down, screaming it at the top of my lungs. And then as the song's finished, I've looked out the window <laughs> and there was someone that was like, <laughs> just looking at me, I was like. Mm. I'm at this point, I don't give a shit. Yeah, yeah, I'm loving life. I think you've won over most of the Australian audience with that last one. Absolutely. He's very much uh, yeah. a legendary. He icon. can bring his wife too, Jane. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be an interesting and a very entertaining dinner, I yeah. imagine. Especially if he brought the old guitar along. Oh, yeah. Well, both of the artists, actually. Yeah. You know, he could strum some tunes at the oh. end and have a bit of a sing-along. It'd be Them great. Them two singing together, Garth Brooks and Jimmy. Oh, I just got... I was shivers. Mm. I actually just got shivers. <laughs> Collaborations. There's another... Like, they're like country blues, bitter sort of... Bitter rock called Cry of Love back in the day. Mm. I'll send you them after this. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant, because I know you like the country stuff. Yeah. Uh, these are a bit of an amalgamation, but mate, you can't like yeah. tap your foot and sing along. Like in terms of lyrical, musicianship, uh, composition of songs, absolutely phenomenal. My dad put me on to them many years ago, and yeah. um, they only made a couple of albums. Uh, this was back uh, late '80s, early '90s, but absolutely phenomenal. I think you'll appreciate. Uh, and I guess to, to wrap up with, if you could. The, the last rapid fire question in composition before the, the final one is if you could put a message on a, a social media post and it can be a small image and or some text and everyone would see it. So it would be on Snapchat, it'd be on Instagram, it'd be on the story, it'd be on Facebook and it was like the most potent ad and it just went out, bang. It got in front of everyone's eyes. What, did the, what is the message you'd like to get across to people? Uh, well, it's actually I've put up a Posts on Snapchat yesterday. I was on my way to work and the sun was rising. It's simple. It's a photo of the sun rising, and the message I put on it is every day you get to see the sun rise is a blessing. Don't waste the time you're given. Here, here. Here, here, my friend. That is it. Because it is. Every day you get to open your eyes. It's a blessing. Mm. Don't waste that time you're given because mm. some people, unfortunately, have had that taken way too soon. Mm. Absolutely, and I, and I think you know the you've within this podcast you've answered the main question that I ask all my guests, which is, can you identify the biggest fear in your life, what it was, and how you overcame it? Now, if you want to specify and add on to that a little bit. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth and say it's been the, off, the obvious, but, you know, what is that biggest fear? Was it specifically cancer itself or was it something along the way or was it even the fear of dying, etc.? And then that facing that, okay, shit, what could happen? And what did you learn from that experience apart no, from what you've already aforementioned? Before I had the cancer, I was, I was wasting my time. Like, well, before I actually moved down to Tokemore, uh, which is a small little town, on the border of New South Wales, Victoria. Um, before I moved down there and then ended up finding out I had the cancer, I wasted my life. I was, well, other than I tried to get it in order when I met Alex and um, tried to start going to the gym, I was wasted my life. I was a chain smoker. I ridiculously drank. I didn't save money. I spent all my money. 
I I was just a completely different person who I am now. And since having the cancer and everything and changed my perspective on life and my outlook and everything, it's just my biggest fear is wasting time. Now, having because that's what actually I thought of that because I had had my scan. I just recently had a scan on Monday, so yesterday that's I saw the sunrise and that's what popped in my head. Wasting time. I've wasted so much time so far in my life. I don't want to waste any more, especially now that I've dealt with this, because that was just a massive kick up the backside and a kick in the teeth at the same time. Mm -hmm. I've wasted so much time and I haven't built myself up anything. I haven't built up my future. And now I've just been diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. I haven't got anything. It's nothing like a slap in the face. Yeah. Like, hey, you may die. Yeah. So wasting time is probably my biggest fear mm. in life now. Mm. Makes sense. And once I'm fully back on my feet, I will not waste another second of any day I'm given. Mm. So don't waste time. Don't fuck around. Yeah. I'm just going to say it as it is. Yeah. It's true, though. And it's easy to do when we take things for granted. Yeah. Hence why I believe most people should start and end their day with gratitude and you know you might turn your nose up at it as i once did in my younger days but ultimately it keeps you grounded and it keeps yep. you identifying the things that you truly cherish in life and it is like a daily dose a daily dose of reality because yep. you can go hey look what i'm searching for the positives without being happy clappy but like what is it in my life that i'm grateful yeah. for and what do i need to not take for granted because at some point it will be taken away yeah. Um, and, and time is finite. Despite all the great research that's being done, you know, for, to improve longevity, it's, that's what makes it so precious. If it was forever, perhaps it wouldn't be that good because we'd all just be fucking around the whole time. Yep. Another bit of advice I've heard recently is being rich is not about the things and money you have. It's about the people you have around you. Absolutely. No one's going to stand at your funeral and be like, he had a sick Lamborghini. Yeah. People are going to be talking about how you made them feel, what you did, the people that you impacted, you know, any accolades you left behind. Yep. And when you're also sat there in your dying days, whether you realize it or not, because everyone's going to be, you know, sometimes you don't know when the number's up, you're not going to think about that. You're going to think about, did you leave a legacy? Did you, did you have any kids, your family? What did you do? Who are the people you spent it with? Yep. You know, where did you go? What did you do with your life? Because the memories you know, are all that remain, or will all that remain at, at some point in time. So I think there's some absolutely phenomenal takeaways for people in this podcast. And I hope most of you listen to it all the way through because it's one of those things where we do get caught up, you know, and we're all guilty of it. You know, life's fast and we yeah. get sort of, you know, in, in social media and we get caught up in careers and all these, as I call them, first world problems. And sometimes it takes something like this to just go, hey, you know what? Let me just, maybe just sit sit back and, you know, sort of take off the rosy glasses and just see things for what they are mm. and, and recalibrate and readjust anything yeah. that's not important in my life. Cut out the waste. It's okay if you get lost. <laughs> it's all part of the journey, right? Yeah. For, for people who want to perhaps reach out, ask you more or, or follow along with your journey and what you're doing now to give back to the community, where are the best places to find you to, to you know, yeah, to have a chat? You can find me on Instagram. Um, I'm sure I'll actually link it. It's uh, Wern Ryan Music. There's not much music on there because of what I've gone through, but I'm going to try and get back to it. He's um, getting there. He's going to get it on. I will. I will. Um, Facebook is just Ryan Wern. Um, and you'll know it's me because you'll see this. A beautiful white dog there. <laughs> um, For yeah. those listening, he's talking about his face. Yeah, this, this, this ugly thing and then a beautiful dog. So, um, yeah, they're the best, best points of contact if you want to reach out to me. Um, no question stupid. You can be as full on if, with the question as you want. I'll answer it if I think it's a bit too personal. I'll let you know, but I'll try and answer anything that you want to ask me as best I can, really. And if you want to catch up, just ask. I won't bite. 
I don't bite. Catch up for a beer or catch up for a coffee if you want to meet me. It's, yeah, if you want to find out more, it's a place to go. Sure. Or just message him. I'm sure he'll message me and let me know. For sure. And I'll, well, as ever, guys, I'll put all those links in the description below to contact Ryan and anything else that's relevant that we've talked about on the topic, whether it's, you know, some of the health professionals, the oncologists, you know, yep. even links to maybe radiation therapy, chemo, just perhaps to just set the standard and slay any misconceptions. I think that's great. And guys, to people listening, if you are going through a tough time, whether it's, you know, something like this or something different, feel free. Sometimes, you know, people are all that we need and they're a lifeline and there's no need to ever suffer in silence. There's a lot of people that unfortunately don't get that help or they don't feel that they can reach out and then it leads down a darker path. So sometimes all you've got to do is just pick up the phone or press the keyboard and send a message or, you know, just put out a lifeline and um, people can help you and we can give back. And as Ryan said, he's, he's happy to answer questions where possible. And I really appreciate you coming on, Ryan, and, and sharing so openly. You know, it's obviously quite a, an intimate subject. There's a lot that you've gone through there. But I think, again, why we do this is to have these real conversations and put it out there for people. If we help one person, that's job done, you know, and to help people get over something like this is, is an incredibly large feat. I really appreciate your time. Thank you again. It's been an honor. It's all right. We're going to get you back on your feet, mate. We're going to get yep. you fighting fit. We're going to get that music out. Guys, for everyone listening, as ever, like, comment, subscribe, send us a comment, send us a message. What did you like? What do you want to see more of? And of course, make sure you share it with someone else who's going to benefit from this knowledge and wisdom to better enhance their lives too. And of course, until the next episode, guys, stay fearless.